All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, meeting or workshop on the IUCN Green List for the Western Indian Ocean. My name is Arthur Tudor from the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. I want to welcome you all for this uh, uh, meeting. And we are glad that uh, you've been able to join us today. Uh, as the uh, list continues to grow, we are seeing more and more people continue to register. Uh, uh, so I'll start by saying that uh, this meeting or this uh, small webinar is organized by IUCN and uh, Wyomsa uh, for the Western Indian Ocean region. And today we're going to talk about uh, the Green List. Uh, many of you may have heard about the Green List, uh, but today we want to shed a little bit more light on what it is. And uh, we'll have uh, a time when we can all discuss after a presentation from the experts uh, who are going to take us through what Green List is and what it is not, and how it can help us uh, in the management of our marine protected areas in the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, so before I outline the objectives of, uh, of today's meeting, I would like, first of all, to recognize uh, the presence of uh, uh, the IUCN team. And uh, I would like to, at this juncture, uh, introduce uh, two people who are going to lead us in this uh, session. I would like to welcome, first of all, uh, Mr. Thomas uh, Berna. He has a tough name. Uh, the Regional Technical Coordinator of the Program on Marine and Coastal Resilience at the IUCN Eastern and Southern Africa. That's a long title. I hope you will remember. So I'll give Thomas uh, a few minutes to say a few words uh, to open for us this uh, session. Welcome, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. After it's uh, you've been brave. You did try to actually pronounce my name. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, I hope you can hear me and and see me well. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here with you all. And this is very exciting, of course. Uh, so I'm Thomas Bana indeed, and I'm the regional head for coastal and marine conservation in Eastern and Southern Africa. So I'm based in Nairobi, where our regional office is and covers so, um, the, the region from here. Uh, even though, of course, as many of you, I'm sure we haven't been able to travel around and, and eventually have uh, in-person interaction. I, I do hope that uh, uh, as soon as possible, really, um, we'll be able to resume some of some of those uh, interaction, I hope. Uh, but in the meantime, today it's a webinar and I'm and of course, you know, I just I don't want to take too much time because I think it's very important for us to have enough time, not only for the for my colleague Bea, who's going to just present after after this um, a bit more on the Greenish process and what has, has been the genesis and really the objective and sort of the goal of of the of the green list. Um, but but what I want to say is really sort of the, the commitment and what I want to uh, reinforce is really the commitment of IUCN in the region to support so both uh, existing marine protected other areas in particular and more broadly uh, protected areas in achieving uh, effectiveness and efficiency and really support them and help them uh, to deliver both the socioeconomic as well as the conservation impact that they were and are uh, supposed to deliver. But we also are looking, of course, as the, at the new uh, or future CBD targets. And you know, we do anticipate a more ambitious target for ocean conservation in particular, of course. And here, we really want also to set up and support the establishment of the Greenlease process as a tool and really as a sort of catalytic um, uh, body in the region that can help actually the region achieve that future targets, be it 30% or be it whatever it will be agreed upon by the parties during the next uh, CBD COP 
uh, but ultimately, and Bea will talk more about that, the green list uh, indeed ultimately sort of aims at recognizing the success of protected areas and here now we're, we're going to talk in particular of marine protected areas but that's it's it's not the the the, the it's like the cherry on top of the cake if i could say the the real and this is sort of the the most relevant part of that green list process is that it's basically sort of set up a, a mechanism of peer-to-peer -peer support and mentorship and guidance that can really help provide tailored support to protected areas and, and, and managers and, and the, and the re, sort of the local stakeholders of those protected areas so that they know how to sort of they, they have a path forward, right? So we've developed those green list standards throughout the very complex and very thorough process worldwide. So, and now they've been recognized as sort of the gold standard for protected areas. So obviously those are, you know, not so easy to reach, but the important is now at least we have a common horizon in, 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 in and, 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 and therefore we also have a path to actually reach there. And the, and the green list process is really aiming at supporting the stakeholders and the practitioners to actually walk the talk and really you know go through that path so that eventually by the end of the process they they, they will be able to uh, reach certification and so um, uh, again here this is the first regional webinar that we're organizing in partnership with wyomsa uh, we are extremely extremely excited of course about this partnership with arthur and his team and uh, and we feel that um, you know that this can really help establish a very strong and inclusive process for the region and of course the secretariat stand uh, ready to support the region our partners our members uh, on that journey so i'm just going to stop here because i think i've already talked far too much and i'm going to hand over to um arthur over to you thank you thomas for your opening remarks and at this point i would like to just say that this webinar is going to provide us with an overview of the IUCN Green List initiative and how it can be applied in protected areas in the Western Indian Ocean region. Now, this session today is specifically uh, working with marine protected areas, but as Thomas said, our intention is to support all protected areas in the region. Uh, so we're going to share experiences and lessons learned from other countries in implementing the IUCN uh, Green List. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a, a very short presentation, but we want to make this session also very interactive. Uh, so our three main objectives for today is to provide an overview of the IUCN Green List Initiative and how it can be applied in peers or protected areas in the Western Indian Ocean region. We're going to share experiences and lessons learned from other countries in implementing the IUCN Green List at the national and site levels. And we're going to get feedback from participants and discuss the potential involvement in the green list process. Uh, so just to uh, set off some ground rules, uh, we are going to invite questions just immediately after the presentation or as the presentation will be going on. We have a Q&A button just at the bottom of your Zoom page. So please use the Q&A button for the questions. Don't use the chat, don't use the chat for the for the Q&A. In the chat, we request you to put your name, the organization or institution you're presenting, and the protected area which you work for. Uh, so we're going to use the chat for introduction because we cannot have a, a whole round of introduction. We are so many here today, uh, those who are participating. So we'll request you kindly to put your name, uh, your institution, your protected area in the chat. And for your question and answers, please use the button at the bottom. It's Q&A we'll be able to address your questions immediately after the presentation and then we shall run a small poll after the q a session and thereafter we shall open the floor for discussions so without uh, saying too much i would like at this juncture to welcome uh, our expert uh, who is going to take us through uh, what green list is now for purposes of uh, just being sure that this thing will run. We have a pre-recorded presentation uh, and uh, it's going to be given to us by Beatrice uh, Shategna. She also has a very difficult name. She will tell us what her name is exactly. She's a program officer of Green List in Africa. 
Uh, so for the program on Africa protected areas and conservation at IUCN Global. Uh, apparently, our two experts have got very long titles, which is good and tells us that they're doing quite a lot in the region. So I don't want to take much of your time. At this point, I will welcome Beatrice uh, for a presentation that will last about uh, 30 minutes, and then we'll enter into the Q&A session. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you, Arthur, for the introduction. And uh, as planned, uh, I'm going now to go through, take you through the presentation of the IUCN Green List. Uh, so basically, we are going to see what it is, uh, try to understand how it works, and uh, and then see uh, how it could be applied to the Western Indian Ocean region. If you are interested. The first question we can ask ourselves is why a green list? Why are we, are we talking about a green list? Actually, the green list, the concept of the green list, come out of the red list one that you might all know, the IUCN red list of species is focusing on uh, the challenges that these species are encountering and that make them vulnerable or threatened um, and it's important to talk about these issues because we need to understand these issues to better then adapt our conservation action to maintain uh, the conservation of these species over the long term but we also realize that we need to talk about successes and that's how the green list was born so the green list focuses on successes and not on the species this time but on areas and the idea behind that is that by fostering and promoting uh, successful areas in terms of conservation outcomes that will inspire other areas to improve their performances and their conservation results to achieve at the end a sufficient uh, number of areas around the world that are that are performing well in terms of uh, conservation impacts so that's the idea behind the green list the Greenest concept actually was born in 2012, so quite a long time ago, and then uh, the pilot phase was run from 2014 to until 2016, and the Greenest was finally officially launched in 2016, so it's a really relatively uh, recent um, uh, uh, label yet, and then it was represented at different international events, uh, and now that the international community, conservation community around the world, wish to see more focus not only on percentage coverage but really on representation and connectivity between areas and especially on uh, the quality of their governance and management effectiveness, the Greenies is actually addressing this, this thing. So the Greenies is nested in global policy in that sense and uh, the CBD COP13 in 2016 uh, actually invites uh, parties to promote the IUC and Greenies as a voluntary standard to encourage the protected area management effectiveness. So we said the Green List is about uh, recognizing successful areas. Which areas are we talking about? We are actu actually talking about protected areas as per the IUCN definition and conserved areas. So basically any areas which is dedicated to conserved nature. And these areas have uh, and how do we measure the success of these areas? So the success will uh, be measured on how they are able to maintain the values they are containing. These values can be natural values, like species, ecosystems, and also cultural values or socio-economic values or even educational values, as long as all of them are related to natural features, because we are talking about areas that are uh, dedicated to conserve nature. So to measure the success of these areas, that's about measuring how well these areas are able to maintain these values over the long term. And that's what we call the conservation outcomes. And these values are also facing at the same time like different threats. So to maintain them over the long term, 
there is a need to address this threat, to face them, and this has to be done through management action that will be taken by the staff of the protected area together with all the relevant stakeholders uh, in uh, through their own decision-making process. And the decision-making process and system which is behind the, the implementation of every uh, management action is what we call the governance. So basically, a successful area, in a nutshell, will be an area which is able to achieve conservation outcomes, so conserving its values, through an effective management and a fair and uh, quality governance system. So that's what the Greenist will look at. And by recognizing the, the, these successful areas around the world, they, we hope that this will inspire other areas even more to do so and therefore to increase the number of areas that are achieving cons good conservation impacts uh, worldwide. Now, in order to measure success, we need to measure it against a benchmark, and this benchmark is the IUCN Green List Standard. This standard is made out of four components uh, that are recalling the field of work we are just talking about. The first component is about governance, the second one and the third one are about uh, management effectiveness and design planning, and the fourth one, which is the most important, is about conservation outcomes. Um, all of these components are split into several indicators, there are 50 indicators in total. And this IUCN Green Standard is actually built uh, on the IUCN Best Practices Guidelines. The component on governance is based on the IUCN Best Practices Guidelines on Governance, and I've recalled here on this slide the five principles that are mentioned in these Best Practices Guidelines and that uh, guide an area to measure how good uh, the quality of, the, of its governance is. Uh, the Best Practices Guidelines on Management Effectiveness are also like displaying five principles and needs to be measured to assess this, and then the, the one on conservation impacts. And these principles, uh, based on the best practices guidelines, have been used around the world uh, by many organizations and they have been developing a, a lot of methodologies and tools that are dedicated to measure the quality of governance of uh, protected areas, conserved areas, or their management activeness and so on. And there are actually more than 70 methodologies that are existing around the world, which is a very good thing. Um, and I'm going to just quickly uh, mention some of them and actually I'm going to only talk about the ones that are the most used in Africa. So you might know about SAGE. SAGE is a tool uh, that is measuring the, uh, gov the quality governance of an area and it's a rapid self-assessment. It has been developed by IED and you have also SAPA that you might know but SAPA as you can see is only looking at the principles of fairness and right. Uh, so it's a very specific tool. Uh, otherwise you have the Greenies and GAPA which are these times looking at all the governance quality principle but in in-depth level. For the management effective side you might know uh, about NET, MET which is widely spread and has been developed by WWF looking at all the aspects of management effectiveness but in a rapid self-assessment way and the Greenist IMED and EOH are other tools that are all of them also looking at all the principles but in a more in-depth uh, detailed way and few of them are actually looking at uh, conservation outcomes are able to measure conservation outcomes so they are the, the ones that, that are able to do that are the Greenist, IMET, and EOH. So having th that uh, many different tools is actually a, a huge uh, asset because that means that, for instance, if an area has a specific issue in terms of fairness and rights uh, in their, their locality, they, will, they, want, they would like to first address this issue. They don't want to look uh, uh, into management effectiveness if there's a, uh, this the specific issue first. So the, the, in that case, they can use SAPA because that will exactly address the issue. And then when they will be okay with that issue, they will solve that problem thanks to SAPA, the found solution and imp implement them. And they may want to go further and look at the other aspect of uh, their governance quality. And in that case, they can either use the GAPA or SAGE or Greenist to go for it. And even uh, in a later point, use another tool for the management effectiveness side. So the, the, the fact that all these tools are based on, a, on um, the same framework uh, make them used in a combined way. You can use them together because you can relate them uh, between each other. And as you can see, the Greenist is the only one which is covering all the aspects of governance, management effectiveness and conservation impacts. That means that whichever tool you are using first because that's that tool was addressing your need, specific need, you can then use the result of that tool and incorporate it into the Greenist if you want to look at a more uh, global, uh, broad uh, 
aspect of the quality of the success of your area performance. Uh, so that's the, that's the way all these tools can be done, but combined together and that diversity in that way, is, in that sense, is very important. The other specificity of the green list is, in the contrary of the other tools, because uh, if you reach all the green list criteria the in the standard, you can then get to uh, that certification level. You need to also then to provide evidences when you are addressing each criteria. It's not only about providing a narrative, but you also need to provide evidences that can be report, uh, pictures, minutes, a meeting, etc. So that's the difference between the greenest and the other tools. What are the benefits of the green list? Let's look at three scenarios. The first scenario is uh, candidate areas, uh, so areas that are involved in uh, self-assessing their performances against the green list standard, but they are still in the process of doing it. In that stage, they can already access uh, the greenest network of all the other areas and experts that are involved in the same system and therefore benefit from their, so from their lesson learned and the solution, successful solution that might have been applied other, um, in other places, areas in the world, and that could be uh, replicated in their own uh, area if that works. And they can obviously receive technical support uh, to improve uh, their performances and to finally meet uh, the greenness criteria. And do, even in that process of like self-assessing and improving their performance, they already attract actually uh, investors and donors uh, to help them to do so. Uh, so that's already that's already like a, uh, an important uh, asset. Now the second scenario, uh, let's look at the areas that have already gone through all this self-assessment process and they have met all the green list criteria and have been recognized as green list areas. So these nominated areas, green listed areas, they obviously get the vi marketing visibility of the green list level and they can use it uh, to attract donors, visitors uh, and also to lobby to prevent non-sustainable use of natural resources around uh, their protected areas. and. Obviously, they also get the recognition for the impact and the success they have reached and therefore the role their area is playing within the national network of protected areas of their country or even their region. And now the third scenario is about the protected area agencies, so agencies that are man managing numerous uh, areas uh, at the same time. And so for them, it's obviously a, a very good way to demonstrate how well they're achieving uh, their international uh, commitments, such as the elephants, uh, uh, the elephants uh, IG target of the CBD. And, and obviously it's a reward for the staff as well to demonstrate how well the staff of these agencies are working because they have uh, many areas that have been recognized and greenlisted in their, in their country. Now let's look at the greenest process itself. So basically, how does that work? So when a country or region uh, decide to go for the green list, then the first step will be for them to engage, which means that uh, first they will uh, benefit from um, a webinar like this one, which is aiming at uh, raising awareness and informing all the, the conservation partners of about what the green list is about uh, and to explain it and to see their interest, whether they will be interested in, in getting involved. And if, uh, and if they are, then the, the second step will be to for, for this jurisdiction that can be a region or, or country to set up an expert group uh, dedicated to assess uh, the application of the, the greenest application of the area that will submit, uh, submit the application. So this expert assessment group uh, for the greenies, we call it EAGLE. Uh, this EAGLE uh, will have two tasks mainly. The first task will be to adapt the global standard. So I, the IUCN global standard can be adapted. That means they can they can adapt some wording uh, to their local uh, region to make sure that it can be understood by all the stakeholders without ambiguity. Uh, and the second task of the EAGLE will be obviously to uh, assess the various uh, greenest applications they will receive and to assist also the, the greenest sites to improve their performances. Then the, um, the, the, the third and fourth uh, step, the diagnosing and implementing part of it, I'm going to detail it in the next slide. 
So let's take an example of a protected area, which is self-assessing its performances against the Greenlist standards. And to do so, they're helped by a, what we call a Greenlist mentor. The mentor is the person that will help the protected area throughout their work of self-assessing themselves and explaining them what the Greenlist criteria are all about and what kind of evidences they need to provide. When this is done and the Greenlist application is completed, uh, the area will send it to the EGLE, the Expert Assessment uh, uh, Group of the Greenlist. This EGLE will review the application. If they feel that there are some evidences uh, missing or they need some more clarification, they can ask more information. They will ask more information to the protected area and the mentor until they get completely satisfied with the application. When they are, then they, they they proceed with a site visit during which they will consult with all the stakeholders of the area to make sure that they have been involved in the process because the Greenest process is a participative process where the, um, stakeholders have to be involved where they have to. When the eagle is totally satisfied with the application of the area, then they will proceed with the next step and they will send it to the uh, international international reviewer. This reviewer is not a staff of IUCN, it's a staff of uh, independent uh, organization, which is an auditing organization, totally independent. And the role of the reviewer is to first look at the content of uh, the Greenest application to make sure that everything is in order, and also to look at the, the way the eagle has worked to make sure that they, are, they were um, complying with the procedures that are described in the uh, IUCN Greenlist uh, manual. If the reviewer needs more information, he can ask for clarification to the eagle or the protected area again until he gets completely satisfied and then he will proceed again and send the, his report uh, and the Greenlist application to the last step, which is the IUCN Greenlist Committee. It's an international committee and this is the one who will finally decide whether or not the protected area or the conserved area can be rewarded with the Greenlist uh, certification. If the committee, this committee feels that there's some missing information and that some criteria still need some a bit, a bit of work, then they will again ask the, the, the protected area to improve a certain aspect of their application until again, and then they will reapply uh, and submit it again to the Greenies Committee. Finally, when the Greenies Committee is totally satisfied and feel that they, they totally meet all the criteria, and they make their decision based uh, upon the report of the international reviewer and the eagle as well and they will d deliver the greenest uh, certification to the area and this area so gets this greenest certification for five years if they want to remi remain longer on the greenest they will need to reapply to re-update uh, their uh, greenest um, uh, application to demonstrate that they are still at the same level or even better so as you can see, it's not a pass or fail process, it's actually all the opposite. You can never be rejected in that Greenish process, you can only be asked to improve your performance until you reach all the criteria of the Greenish standards. So as you can see, the Greenish process is a voluntary commitment uh, from the protected areas and conserved areas. They are the ones deciding whether or not they want to uh, do the self-assessment. Um, uh, if they meet all the criteria, they get that recognition uh, at worldwide level, which is uh, the, as a green list area. Uh, and all this process is an independently assured and credible process, which is described in the green list user manual, um, which describes who does what, when and how in at every step of the Greenest process and how all this information are also put into Compass. Compass is the online portal with all the, that, that uh, combines all the information about the Greenest. Now, let's have a look at where we are in terms of green listed areas in the world. So today we have uh, 15 countries that are uh, engaged in the green list process and 49 areas out of them that you can see on this slide that are already green listed. So means they are, that means that they have already uh, met all the green list criteria and standards. Now, if we zoom in to Sub-Saharan Africa especially, here we have uh, seven countries that have already uh, engaged in the Greenlist process. Out of them, six have already functional eagles, and one of them, Kenya, has already three areas that are Greenlisted, means that they have already met all the uh, Greenlist uh, criteria and standard. Uh, so, 
if we if the wired region is interested in having getting engaged in the greenies as well then uh, they will we will put in place a regional uh, eagle for the west uh, indian african uh, ocean region and this regional eagle will like support and complement uh, the existing eagle in Kenya, uh, Madagascar, uh, and Mozambique, of, uh, not yet, but in the future, uh, that in some expertise that they might like, especially in marine expertise, for instance. And this regional eagle of the Western Indian Ocean will also obviously um, uh, benefit to all the other countries of the region that don't, don't have an eagle yet, and then will uh, do the, play the role of an eagle for these countries. So in conclusion, the Green List, uh, as we said, is a st sustainability standard uh, that is globally consistent and locally relevant, as it can be adapted at local uh, level as well. Uh, the Green List helps to improve performances because on a voluntary basis, the areas, conserved area and protected areas, decide themselves whether or not they want to uh, assess their performances, self-assess their performances against the Green List standards. And then through that process, that can take, it's a journey, and it can take months or years, it doesn't matter. They identify the gaps, uh, propose uh, some improvements, put in place solutions uh, so that they can finally meet uh, all the greenest uh, criteria. And when they do so, they get uh, a recognition, so the certification uh, process, the greenest level. Uh, through that process, the, these areas are supported by a number of experts, and especially the mentors and the eagles uh, members, uh, so that are experts at local level and that are very important uh, in, in making this all happen. And finally, the greenest is also a tool that helps to frame policies and investment because it's nested, nested in uh, international policies. No, I just wanted to quickly take you through uh, the, the experience of Kenya because Kenya has been the first Green East country uh, in Africa because it was a pilot country for Africa when it just started and so it's the oldest one and there are some, some lessons to, to share with you. So just a quick overview of how the protected area system works in Kenya. You have uh, on this map uh, green areas that are the ones that are managed by, by the um, uh, state uh, agency, which is called KWS, and the brown areas are the what we call conservancies, and the, these areas are a mix of different types of governance and different types of IUCN categories. But these conservancies are quite recent. Huh? They exist since, uh, I mean, uh, they've been existing for the last 10 years only, and they have only been uh, recently recognized uh, officially uh, by the Kenyan uh, government in 2013 actually and they were really keen to get involved in the Greenies process because they wanted to have uh, a recognition about the role they were playing within uh, the protected area network of Kenya in terms of conservation impact uh, so they wanted to get that international recognition and they were also keen to uh, get this recognition for marketing purposes marketing for conservation and also to share the knowledge they have gained throughout uh, uh, their, their existence uh, for the, the, the benefit of other areas in Kenya, but also in the region. So the first lesson learned from Kenya is the need for engagement at site level. When we talk about engagement, the first thing is for the site to commit a staff, uh, which we call a green list representative, which is dedicated to collect the information and the evidences uh, that will be needed to uh, demonstrate that this area um, is uh, addressing the different green list indicators of the green list standards. So his role is uh, really about collecting information and making sure that all the information are there and it's very important. Uh, then the area also need to make sure that uh, they can demonstrate that they are involved, they involve stakeholders uh, throughout the process and they can uh, provide uh, evidences for that because the green is a participative process and they need uh, to, to demonstrate it. And finally, the, they also, throughout the journey of self-assessing their performances with the green standard, they will see that some at some point they might not meet some criteria or some indicators. So they will need to put in place action. Okay, so we, if don't, we don't meet these indicators, what can we do? What solution can we implement in order to fill that gap uh, and meet these indicators in the future? And that's what we call action plans. So they will need to put in uh, to implement action plans uh, that will help them at the end of the day uh, to be able to demonstrate that they are meeting all the greenest indicators and therefore their conservation impacts. The second lesson learned is about sustainability of the greenest process at national level. 
if so let me explain how it works for Kenya how the greens process works here so you have the greenest uh, Greens representatives in each uh, site, uh, and these uh, Greenist representatives are supported by Greenist mentors to help them uh, self-assessing their performances against the Greenist uh, criteria. And in Kenya, there are actually conservancies are uh, supported already by uh, different organizations, and these organizations, like we have NRT here and Cordio on this map, have uh, dedicated some of their staff that are already uh, supporting areas through their normal work actually to become greenest mentors. So this is not adding more work on their shoulders, it's just uh, rewarding the work they are already doing in supporting these areas. So these mentors are supporting from NRT and from Cordio, are supporting the NRT conservancies or the Cordio uh, uh, size through their journey and when their application uh, will be ready they will submit it to the focal point, Greenest focal point, uh, which is the person who is coordinating all the process at national level and preparing uh, all these uh, applications for the Eagle to then be able to review uh, this application and to provide uh, their um, assessment. Uh, Let's look at how cost effective is that system in place. So if we look at the site level, uh, the, the cost of uh, to be implemented there is about staff time uh, that had to be provided by the Greenleaf site representative in terms of helping of collecting the information needed. And also if they have to put uh, in implement some action plans, they will need some money. So either they already have this money or they can look for it through grants uh, or other kind of um, uh, donors. And being part of the Greenleaf process which actually can actually help them to uh, source this uh, money that they need. It, at the Greenest Mentor side uh, level, uh, the, the cost of it is to provide again some uh, staff time uh, in supporting all the Greenest representatives and also they will have to do that in a very closely manner and to support them on site so to be able to, uh, pro to perform site visits. But in Kenya, because this Greenest mentors are actually already part of organizations that are definitely working on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis with the with the different uh, areas. Uh, these site visits are already uh, happening anyway, so it's not an added cost. The role, the role of the Greenest mentor, by the way, is very important. Without them, it's very difficult for protected area or conserved area to make it until the, the Greenest um, certification. So it's very important to have Greenest mentors. The, when we look at the focal point level, so the person which is coordinating the process and supporting the green mentors at national level, this person needs to provide staff time, again it's about 30 days a year, and finally the EGO uh, has to review the application and uh, adapt the Greenest standards. They also have to provide staff time, which is pro bono as per the Greenest user manual. Uh, and also they will need to perform at least one site visit per site. So this, there is some little money uh, involved here. And for Kenya, uh, this money was provided by IUCN projects. So as you can see, the cost effectiveness of the system really rely on how uh, uh, the, the different uh, level of this uh, system can uh, take advantage of what is already happening in the country. In that case, the fact that there are already many organizations working very closely with protected areas and conserved areas in helping them uh, in their governance and uh, management effectiveness processes. So that makes this system uh, sustainable in the long term because the journey of uh, the greenest is it's, uh, it can take months and year, years, it doesn't matter. And um, the most important is like it's in the, the greenest areas can improve their performances along the way and it has to be uh, sustainable on the long term. And here I just wanted to share with you some uh, statements of uh, uh, some of our uh, Eagle uh, members in Kenya uh, that have been there for quite a long time, actually, uh, for the beginning, for Nigel. And it's also very important to have uh, Eagle members that are dedicated and uh, convinced that uh, uh, the Greenist is, is uh, an approach that can help sites to, to, to enhance their performances, because that also makes, uh, contributes to make the system uh, sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you have any question and we'll be very happy to provide clarifications. Thank you. Right. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, uh, for the presentation. Uh, sorry for those who, who are not able to receive the presentations uh, clearly. I've got a few 
concerns here. So we are very sorry about those who are not able to get uh, the streaming properly. Uh, be not worried because we are going to share this presentation uh, on YouTube on a link that we shall later give you. So, uh, and obviously if you really need more information, we are here to, to give you that information. Uh, so at this point, uh, thank you very much, Beatrice. We are supposed to address questions. Uh, already there are some that have been answered directly, uh, but at this time we have two questions. So uh, this will be addressed by Beatrice, I and Thomas, where possible. And uh, as uh, we'll do this for the next few minutes, and then Beatrice will run a quick poll the poll is to help us understand a little bit more about uh, your interest in Green List and how much you know about the Green List and how we can come in to support you to start off the process. Uh, so, and then uh, I think probably as you will be working on the poll, you may also come up with many more questions for discussion. So we still have just about 40 minutes of this uh, webinar and we'll be very happy to open it up for, for, for more discussions. So at this point, we'll address the two questions that are already on my screen. Uh, I'll start with the easy one from Humphrey Maudi. How does the green list differ from IMET? Okay, how does it differ from IMET? Uh, Beatrice, you want to take on that? Yes, yeah, sure, my pleasure. <laughs> So, uh, so actually, the, the IMET uh, and MET, there are two different tools, two different methodologies that are meant to assess uh, the management effectiveness of protected areas. Uh, and uh, they are looking only at the management effectiveness side. Okay, they are really dedicated to that. Uh, on the other side, the Green is it's also uh, assessing the management effectiveness side of the protected area, but on top of that, it also look at the governance aspect, the quality of the governance, and also on the conservation impacts. Okay, which is also also addressed by IMET. So the difference between the two is that the Green is a bit more is a bit more broad than the IMET and the MET because it integrates the governance side. And uh, if you, and the other thing is, if you reach all the greenness criteria, you can then apply to have the greenness certification, which is not, you don't have a IMET or MET certification. So that's the main difference between the two. I hope that's answer the question. Yeah, so just to add, IMET is uh, just to check how your protected area is doing. Uh, so you keep checking on how your PA is doing using IMET. IMET is a new tool that has been developed by IUCN uh, we've started using it in different MPAs in Kenya and Tanzania. And it's also a tool that will encourage other MPAs in the region to also try and use it. So IUCN and Wyomsa uh, can also support you if you really need help with the use of the IMET. But uh, the, 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 the green list is a mark of certification. Uh, so your PA is, is certified as having met the highest standards of conservation. And everybody wants to be certified as the best. So green list uh, is a process that you have to go through. And at the end of it all, uh, you get a mark of certification as one of the best managed protected areas in the world. And that is where we are heading to as a region. So the next question here is, uh, is a long one. It's from Sibyl. Sorry if I pronounce your name wrongly. And it says, for us to reach the 30 by 30 target, how can the international conservation community and governments be encouraged to create a conducive investment climate, that is policies, regulatory framework, fiscal in incentives for the private sector to invest in protected areas for the sake of management effectiveness of protected areas, and in particular investment in MPAs such as privately uh, protected PAs highlighted in the resolution 36 of the IUCN that was adopted in the last World Congress in Hawaii in 2016, which is about protecting privately protected areas. That's a mouthful. But I think in short, the question is asking us, what can we do to ensure that there's more investment in privately protected areas, marine areas particularly? And probably I'll attempt that question by saying that yes, uh, private protected areas play a very important role, particularly in the Western Indonesian region. We have examples like the Chumbe uh, Marine National Park, uh, which is known for good practice. But as a region, I think we've not highlighted this very much. I think uh, recently, Wyomsa and the Nairobi Convention uh, did an evaluation of marine protected areas in the Western Indian Ocean region. 
and we're going to produce a report called the MPA Outlook Report, which also highlights the important role that private protected areas play in the region. So I think part of the efforts that currently we are working on the region is to highlight the importance of privately protected areas, just as much as we highlight community managed areas and government protected areas. So I guess with that kind of effort, then we are able to attract more attention also to privately managed areas. And in that way, uh, we will be able to direct also support to those areas. As it is, as a Western Indian Ocean region, really, we want to look at a well-connected system of marine protected areas, whether they're managed by communities, by governments, or privately, and work together towards a common goal. So I hope that addresses that question. Uh, the next question is uh, from Natalie. And Natalie says, hello, I was having a problem seeing the slides clearly, and the voice was a little bit low. The presentation is very interesting. My question is, what is the cost implication for an MPA that wants to be green listed? Thank you, Beatrice. Yes, so and I think it will also address the, the other question of Judith, which is the next one thing. How can IUCN support yeah. development and implementation of action plans for a protected area to enable it qualify for the green listing? So actually, the IUCN is providing the green list standard, which are available and uh, that has to, can be used by everyone. Okay, so that's what IUCN is providing. Uh, but then IUCN cannot provide the funds for sure, uh, uh, sadly. So okay. the thing is, if you get involved in the green list uh, process, then you can attract uh, investors from other uh, organizations and donors, uh, especially. Uh, and there, it's all actually already happening in some countries in Africa, where some donors have, uh, I mean, said to all the protected area that if they would get engaged in the Green East process, then as donors, they will support them throughout the journey until they reach the standard. So that's already happening. So the Green East will help in attracting donors, but IUCN will not provide the funds directly because we don't have these means. Or, uh, uh, but by the way, there are also some grants that are existing, and I'm thinking now about the Biopama uh, grants uh, that are provided by the European Commission. And these grants are especially dedicated for areas that want to improve their management effectiveness and their governance. So it's totally aligned with the Green East uh, requirements. So basically, if you happen to need some grants to implement some action plan, you can apply to this Biopama grant, for instance, and uh, proceed by implementing your plan. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I know a few a few protected areas in the region, uh, like Kisite, have already received the Biopama grant that should help them to uh, move on the green list uh, uh, process. So as Beatrice says, uh, by starting off the process, you are most likely uh, going to attract uh, people who are going to support you in different ways. So we, by embarking on the process, you already uh, attract attention and uh, also you can receive support in that way. Now, uh, again, uh, okay, says uh, well answered and we're looking forward to the MP Outlook report. We're very ready to cooperate whatever we can and Chumbe will apply for green list certification. So let's give Chumbe a clap. We already have one candidate saying they're going for the green list and we want more of you to uh, say you're going for the green list. Okay, I don't see any other questions at this point. Uh, your questions are still welcome. Let them come in. Uh, as they come in, I'll ask Beatrice to run the poll, uh, run the quick poll. It will take us about five minutes to complete. And uh, as you conduct, as you run the poll, please also keep typing in your questions. After five minutes, we will come back for a general discussion for another 30 minutes, and then we shall close this webinar. So please uh, roll out the poll. Uh, but meanwhile, continue typing in your questions. Thank you. So you shall see on your screen uh, a, a window with a poll and you can answer the question by just clicking <coughs> to each question and then when you finish you submit it. Yeah.
Uh, if you're having a problem with the poll, also let us know uh, so that we can use, uh, can send it to you later on. But uh, we encourage all of you to uh, fill it up right now. If you can, it's going to take a very short time. Thank you.
Okay, so I think we have now 30, yeah, 34 people, almost everybody on the poll. So you can still go for a few minutes, second, and then we'll finish it. Yeah, we'll give you uh, 30 seconds to complete, and we start on the other questions. So you have 30 seconds to complete the poll, and then we embark on the other questions. And thank you for those who have returned the poll. Uh, very helpful. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue with our question uh, session. And feel free also to, uh, uh, if you want to speak, uh, the We'll, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll give you time to speak as well. So uh, this is now, we're going into an open discussion. We're going to answer the questions, but at the same time, it's an open uh, session for discussion. So if you want to say something, please you raise up your hand and our administrator will allow you to speak. Uh, so the next question uh, we have in front of us today is, uh, uh, who appoints for and pays for the Eagle? Uh, okay, Beatrice, can you help us with that question? Who appoints and who pays them? Sure. So <clears throat> for the payment part, actually, uh, as described in the Green East User Manual, which again, it's the manual which describes all the procedures of the Green East, it's specified that the eagles are not paid, actually. They act as a pro bono uh, basis. And, they, and their work, uh, so they have, when they engage to be an eagle member, they, they they engage that they're going to dedicate 10 days uh, of their time, 10 days per year. Huh? It's not a lot of days, it's just 10 days per year, where they will use these days to uh, review the application and do their Eagle member work. Uh, so this is part of the um, uh, Greenies procedures to make sure for transparency reasons that there is no conflict of interest. Uh, then the second question about how do they get involved? So all the procedures, again, are described in the Greenies manual, but in a nutshell, uh, there will be a low of a call for, uh, for application that will be launched at a wide level, I mean, for all the wire region. Uh, and so we will, I mean, for experts to submit the application, so all the detail of the application will be described there. And after this uh, launch for call for application, we will receive all this application. The, the chair of the WCPA, the chair of the WCPA of the region uh, will uh, go through it, uh, check that all the information are required are there and uh, that they comply with the greenest uh, user manual uh, requirements. Then the international world viewer will again uh, uh, go through it and validate uh, what is uh, what they what can approve and after that uh, once the eagle uh, the international reviewer has, has uh, validated the eagle is then formed and once they are formed the first thing they have they will receive is actually a training. The eagle members will be trained on uh, how to uh, review applications and their roles in the green list and so on. So that's how it works for the eagle. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Somebody is saying they cannot see the poll. Catherine, we will be able to share the poll later on if you like. Uh, so please just write uh, back to us via email. Or we'll be able to share the poll for those who have not had a chance to look at the poll. The next question is from Sabrina. It says, to what extent does the green list application process require permission from of the local government. I guess here is where the protected areas are managed by the local government. Yeah, so um, so the green list process is a voluntary process. Huh? Uh, so the only thing that is required by, by a country, so a jurisdiction can be a country or a region, is for this region or country to set up an eagle. But so, and to, and to set up an eagle and to, to have uh, enough uh, conservation partners that are uh, willing uh, to go for the green list process so that it can benefit for all the, the people in the, in the, in the country. Um, so how do we do it usually? is when a jurisdiction is interested, then uh, the, the, the agency uh, responsible of managing the parks uh, and the reserve of this uh, country uh, send an official letter then that they are interested in getting committed. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we launch the process of um, uh, calling for the experts, eagle experts and so on. So that's the only thing. 
Yeah. Thank you, Beatriz. Uh, the other question says that, uh, uh, will you have an order of scale for the resources needed to start the grid list journey? Presumably uh, with the self-assessment uh, in the number of staff, average time required, and the components to be filled out, e.g. surveys, participatory assessments, etc. So here the question, uh, can you estimate the amount of resources that would be needed to start off this journey? Well, it really depends on the area. Uh, so, but the main the main thing that the site has to commit is a staff time. So that person who is going to coordinate the self assessment process uh, at the site level, and and I mean that site has already many things already in place, management plan, and they are uh, implementing it. Uh, I mean uh, already. So it's, it's, it's uh, this person will collect uh, the relevant information that connect with the greenest criteria, and. So it will be only staff time. The only money that will be needed, the fund and the, the fund that could be needed, is when when they do this self assessment together with the colleagues and the, the other stakeholders that need to be involved. Uh, they will see that they might not meet some certain indicators of the green list. Uh, so I, I take a basic example. But let's say the area has not a management plan yet, and that's one of the criteria of the green list, of course. So in that case, okay, we don't meet that criteria, so we need to uh, develop a management plan. How do we do? So for that thing, for sure, we we need some funding because you need to organize meetings and so on and in that case you will need to look for funding so either you can apply to grants uh, that are related to uh, the green list like biopama for instance and develop your action plan so in a nutshell there is no funding you don't need funding uh, per se uh, if you can reach uh, all the criteria uh, from, from from scratch but if you need to and if you need to implement management uh, action plan there you will need some additional funding the only thing that you need for sure is to dedicate a person so staff time uh, that we coordinate the process uh, at, at the site level. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, Humphrey is asked, but he's put the question in the wrong place. We said you put in the question and answer, but he says, can only an MPA be certified as a green list or need the whole country? Uh, so he's asking whether the certification can apply to an individual site or must it be the whole country? It's all, always an individual site. The green list is per site. Uh, it's dedicated for protected area or conserved area only. So it's per site. It's very simple. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, Peter is asking, what competencies must the mentors have to assist peers in the green list process, and how are they appointed? Uh, so can you repeat the question? It disappeared. From oh, the so Peter is asking how the uh, what what competencies or what qualifications that does the mentor need to have, and how are they appointed? Okay, so the the mentor are appointed by the ego, uh, and or the the sites themselves. They can also choose uh, mentors. Um, the competencies that they need to have is to have some. They to need to be able to run uh, the self assessment tools, like if they have done before, like a, a IMET or MET or any other tools. They are already uh, used to that and they know how to do it. Uh, because the Greenist is also one of these tools uh, at the end. Um, and anyhow, uh, if a mentor if someone wants to become a mentor the first thing they will go through is again to have a training on uh, the, the greenist again and also on self-assessment uh, in general so they will go through that training they will receive a capacity building specific specifically on that yeah Thank you, Beatrice. so the mentors will receive specific trainings and support from the experts uh shamti is asked the mps on the implementation of the green list rather than the MPS search for the funds. I think it was answered later, earlier, later on, but again, which is, if you don't mind, just clarify. To answer which one? Sorry, I'm, I'm lost. Can you repeat? Uh, I was asking about, again, the support from IUCN and Wyomsa to implement the green list. It, you answered that, but just maybe just clarify it again so that so neither IUCN or YMSA provide funding per se, but there are grants that are already existing and that totally align with the green list uh, <clears throat> requirements. And these grants, for instance, are the Biopama uh, small grant uh, that is open um, several times a year and which is dedicated to support uh, areas, protected or conserved areas, to improve their management effectiveness and their governance. So you can apply to those grants uh, to 
uh, improve uh, your, your performances and throughout your greenest journey. Thank you. Uh, but obviously, IUCN and Wyomsa will always uh, support you uh, in terms of marketing what you're doing, talking about what you're doing so that we, you attract attention. So uh, that is possible. Uh, Beatrice Jerop from Kenya, I guess, is asking, uh, is it possible that every country or MPA be taught on this independently? So is it possible that we can also train countries independently or MPA sites that are interested? Can they have special sessions on this training? Yeah, of course, all this material first will be uh, available online so you can access it whenever you need to. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other trainings uh, that are going to be provided later on, like on the mentors uh, for mentor trainings, for instance, are also meant to be uh, shared uh, widely uh, afterwards. So the material should be shared, yes, online. Excellent. So materials will be shared, but again, if you require a special uh, training, a need, if you can organize yourself as a country, as a few MPAs together, uh, we will be happy to spare some time to, to talk to you again, uh, because we really want to see this process moving forward. Yeah. So I guess the, I, I'm sorry, the last I question to... I have on my Q&A, all right, Beatrice? I just wanted to add, yeah, of course, if you, on top of this material that is available, uh, if you, as, as Arthur said, if you are a group of uh, people that are interested or even yourself, you just contact me. Uh, I've provided my email uh, on uh, the uh, PowerPoint that you will receive just after the webinar. So you just can, can contact me and we can see how we can work together on that path. Right. Uh, for forget a a good sizable number of people who are with more uh, in-depth training probably uh, on this so that we reach as many people as we can. Uh, I think for the Q&A that marks the end of that session unless if you have any question we still ask you to send them forward. So we'll enter into the discussion uh, part of this meeting and I could see Catherine had raised her hand up so if you can give Catherine time to speak please. So Catherine, I can, I can, I think you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Catherine Sina. So please, if you want to ask questions directly, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll give you time to ask a question. Catherine, I've seen your hand up. Please unmute and ask a question or contribute. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, we can't see Catherine. So. Uh, so fine, it's, it's still open for Q&A as well as uh, open discussion. So let's, let's hear from you people. Uh, Beatrice, so are there any indicators from the poll that uh, you can already talk about? Uh, uh, so yeah, I can share the results quickly. Uh, right. I, I don't know if, oh, yeah, I can show them on the screen. So you might have access to them. Uh, do you? Right. Yes. So that's the yeah, result of the polls. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have what would be the obstacles you may face to implement the green list process. Many people think that lack of capacity is an issue. Of course, lack of staff and others. So uh, we will look into the issue of uh, capacity. So that's very important. So what would you need to start the green list process? Uh, prior capacity building on how to run the GL self-assessment. I guess that also comes out very strongly. I don't know if you can scroll down. I, or it's me to scroll down. Let me see. All right, I can scroll down. So what opportunities do you see in having a regional expert assessment for the Green List Eagle in charge of reviewing the Green List applications from any protected conserved area in the region? Uh, a regional e eagle will gather expertise on marine areas for various your countries. Okay, so we've got some interesting results here that we'll share later, but there's a question that is coming in now, uh, which says, uh, can a print version of the, can a print version of the GN manual? Okay, I guess they asked, is there a print version of the GL manual? 
Yes, there is, and uh, the green list manual as well as the standard uh, of the green list. There are two different documents. They are available online, and uh, you can access them the, from the green list uh, website. And the link to the green list website is uh, on the last uh, slide of my presentation that you will receive in PDF at the end of the webinar. Or you just go to Google and you, you Google green list, and you will find that uh, website very easily. And from there, you can download uh, this green list manual as well as the green list standards per se. All right, so Peter is saying, would anyone like to expand on what other obstacles, as per the poll, may be faced in implementing the green list process in your country? So we talked about capacity building, we talked about staff. So what other obstacles are we seeing here? Somebody who indicated other, please share with us what, you, what the other obstacle could be. Uh, but as you think about that, Judith is asking, how can we use the green list process to progressively increase MPA area to 30 percent to expand protected area coverage in the region. That's a tough one, bit you did, but I'll try it out. I think uh, the coverage uh, and uh, the green list go hand in hand. So basically, what we are trying to to do here is first of all to ensure that uh, what we have as already existing protected areas are effectively managed are certified as well managed. That is the first step. Uh, the second step then is to say, all right, we are doing well here. How can we increase the areas uh, that can be, can reach the same standards as the areas that are already well managed? Because currently the challenge that we have is that uh, even the existing areas, some of them are not very well managed. So we need to deal with that problem first, even as we go about 30%. Uh, and uh, of course, the green list will help us to uh, to identify uh, areas where probably there are a little bit of challenges in terms of uh, moving forward with uh, management. Uh, but as a country, I think uh, it can be applied as 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 a yardstick. You can use it uh, to set your target for 3030 and say that you want to to put 30 uh, percent of your country coastal and marine area under good or effective management, which also includes green list. So again, it is an important way to set very high standards uh, for yourselves as countries and as, 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 as groups of protected areas uh, to be able to move beyond what you are now to uh, attain better management or effective management. But more than that, ensure that the areas that are placed under effective management are expanded. Because I think that is a bigger goal uh, that we are all aspiring for, that by 30 30, we have equitably and effectively managed marine protected areas in the wheel. So 30% of the wheel under effective and effectively managed MPAs that are all green listed. That would be the world record. I think we'll go into the Guinness Book of Records for that. And that is where we're heading to. So uh, thank you that for those very interesting questions and comments. Uh, Peter's question is still unanswered. What are these other obstacles? Can somebody please answer that? Those who took the poll, please. Anybody? All right. Uh, we'll be interested to know what these 16% other obstacles are. Could it be language barrier? Is a green list in other languages like French and Portuguese, Beatrice? I think those yes. are other obstacles. <laughs> yes, the, the, the green list standards are, are, are translated uh, into uh, the English, uh, French, uh, Spanish for sure. Spanish. Portuguese, uh, I think it's on process, so it's already been done. Uh, no, it's already been done. So Portuguese is already existing as well, yeah. Excellent. So the language issue is not an obstacle because the green list manual and all instructions are in other languages as well. I'm sure Humphrey can help us translate it into Swahili, if that is possible. So then looks like uh, there are no more uh, answers up. Arthur. So that means that uh, people are satisfied with the question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Carry on. Uh, 
Yeah, just real quick, uh, maybe in the in in while people sort of gather their thoughts, maybe if they if they can sort of uh, if there is more question, I just wanted to complement a bit on what you said about about uh, Judy's question about you know how can the green list support uh, countries and the region really in, uh, in reaching the the thirty by thirty target. I think here. Um, at least the way that has been presented in the way sort of we really aim at establishing the greenness process, what we want to do more than anything else, obviously, is, you know, um, recognizing success and celebrate successes when protected areas in here in particular, we're talking about marine protected area actually reach uh, the recognition of being green listed, which is obviously sort of an incentive to, you know, to, to go for it. But more, I think very importantly, it's, you know, what we are aiming at doing here is really establishing a support system for practitioners, including, of course, you know, uh, government agencies, as well as communities, conservancies or LMMAs, or also uh, to private sectors so that they, they feel more confident that they can actually engage on that journey. Feel that there is actually, they won't want. Right? Because here what we are establishing is this regional eagle with those mentors. If they have doubt, if they don't know how to do things or how to go about things, then they can reach out to this support system. And that to me, I think is absolutely you know, critical, not only if we want to actually reach this effectiveness and efficiency uh, of, of MPS, but also to sort of create you know, the confidence uh, in the region that it's actually not you know, uh, impossible to establish this type of uh, uh, conservation measures. Um, so in that sense, I think it can really sort of create these enabling conditions for more actors beyond just the government. Obviously, the government will right. always have a critical role to play. But here again, you know, communities and private sector will also have a very, very strong role to play. And I believe that, again, that, that support system will um, enable and enhance them to actually uh, engage in that journey. And now the other part, which I think is also quite critical, and, and we've talked about it a little bit already, is that indeed when you know, a site um, commit itself to the green list process, it has been seen that suddenly you know, there is a recognition from donors and other partners that you know, this is a site that is engaging on the world of excellency. They are really committed to achieve uh, the green list standards and really to perform as best as they can. And therefore, they are much more able to attract uh, funding as well as tourists and, 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 and other type of activities and investors. And so in that sense, here again, you know, it's a way of creating those enabling conditions. Here we're talking about in particular financing, you know, streams that can suddenly, you know, increase because uh, those sites actually engage on the green list process. So hopefully both like the, so the support system and the fact that those sites engage on the green process will also attract more funding and therefore hopefully um, support the region and the countries to reach the 30 by 30 target. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important, Thomas. I think as you correctly said, uh, uh, green list is, is not an end in itself. The most important thing is the process or the journey that we all embark on and work together as a region. Uh, and to support that, also, Wyomsa uh, is going to launch uh, uh, the, the MPA network for the WIO. We've established, we already have an existing uh, Western Indian Ocean Marine Protected Area Management Network that brings together government MPAs, community-managed MPAs, and private MPAs into a network where we can share information, have discussions, share ideas, uh, uh, you know, share opportunities that exist in the region and strengthen our relationship as protected area practitioners in the region. So Wyomsa will be informing you very soon about the launch of this site where you will be able to register as members or as, as MPAs. And this is a forum where we can use to advance this uh, discussion about green list. I met the use of management effectiveness tracking tool, opportunities for funding, uh, the WIO Compass Certification of Professionals. So it is a site for MPA practitioners in the region. And we want to use it to build that strong community of MPA support in the region. So we will be notifying you soon. Uh, please, uh, when we invite you, come in big numbers so that uh, we continue with this important discussion about uh, supporting uh, marine conservation in the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, so that was just an addition as I wait for questions. Uh, there's no more questions. I can just say thank you very much from Judy and thank you from Sibel.
I guess uh, we look like we have run out of questions. Uh, I think it's okay at that point. Uh, in that case, uh, Beatrice, do you have any last words? Or Thomas, any last words before we close? Uh, perhaps we well, just a last word on my side, and then I will uh, uh, let Thomas uh, add this. Um, so after this uh, yeah. webinar, uh, if you have more questions or more comments, please don't hesitate to share with us. Uh, you will receive uh, an email just uh, tomorrow, uh, so that where you can send more uh, questions and comments. And you will also receive a small, a very short survey uh, where you can actually explain uh, the orders, like uh, when uh, you, you, the, the question, the, poll, the question of the poll that you, you've just gone through. Uh, for the other uh, things, you can explain what you meant, and then we can continue discussing with you and address them. So that's the purpose of this uh, webinar, so to really get into, understand what are the issues you might encounter to help you to go through it. So please uh, go through that survey. It's very short. It will take you just two minutes. Uh, and, uh, and you will also receive the, the PDF of the uh, presentations with the contacts uh, that you can reach out, and also uh, the draft of the feasibility survey for the wire region, and you can also provide feedback on it, and your feedback is very important to us. And to make it simpler for you, I will just highlight it in that document, like few uh, paragraph in yellow, where your feedback is very important. So if you have time to go through it, it will be very helpful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, any last words? Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Arthur. And, and, and again, Bea, of course, thanks a lot for taking us through the, the presentation and the discussion. I think that was been uh, very, very interesting. And, and I'm very, very pleased to see that there is so many people who have actually been able to attend. Uh, as Arthur and Bea said, we also send around the, the, the recording of, of that session. So hopefully the one that who, who could not attend today will be also able to, to, to watch the, the webinar. And uh, as Bea said, of course, we, you know, we stand ready to respond to more questions. And, and really, at the end of the day, this is really the start of a discussion. Uh, we, uh, together with Wyomsa, we, we, we are committed to support the establishment of that process in, in the region uh, and ultimately really support you know, the, the region to reach uh, the next CBD target when it comes to ocean protection, obviously committed to providing the right type of support to our uh, ocean heroes, which are really the, the managers of those marine protected areas. Um, so I'm very, very excited, of course. And uh, as I said, I think this is just the start of a discussion and very excited to see uh, where, where this journey will take us to. All right, thank you. And, and uh, of course, Arthur, as always, uh, great seeing you and thank you so for being such a great host. <laughs> Over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank also the participants for finding your uh, time to uh, be part of this important uh, uh, process and meeting. Uh, we really take that seriously. And as uh, uh, Thomas and British have said, we will continue supporting you. Please feel free to ask questions even outside of this webinar. We'll be happy to, to respond to your questions. Uh, any other matters that you feel that we can support uh, and please let us know because as Thomas said, we really are interested in building a strong community of uh, conservation practitioners in the region. So with that note, I would like to say Asante Sana, thank you very much, uh, merci beaucoup, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you.